Hello and welcome dear students. This is a lecture on phallocentric criticism. Since phallocentric criticism is a kind of literary feminism, so I'll begin with literary feminism and we'll proceed to discuss phallocentric criticism. So let's begin. So to give you a quick understanding, let's see on the slide, literature plus feminism equals to literary feminism. That is, when you apply feministic perspective to the field of literature, it becomes literary feminism. That is, literature plus feminism makes it literary feminism. So now you people may be curious to know when and why did it start it, how it works, what do we get from it. So when exactly literary feminism emerged, how does this literary feminism work and what is the significance of literary feminism? Let's see. Uh, literary feminism is a product of second wave feminism. As you all know, second wave feminism emerged in 1960s around this women's liberation movement. So this literary feminism was a revolutionary approach to literature since it brought a suspicion of established ideas to the field of literature. So literary feminism actually was a kind of revolution because it challenged the already established ideas that was there in the field of literature. Literature was viewed as a powerful means of creating and perpetuating belief system. So literature was seen as a tool to create and perpetuate belief system. As you know that patriarchy itself is a kind of constructed belief system and it is through this belief system we tend to believe men as superior and women as inferior to them. So these are our beliefs of our society and literature as a tool helps to create and perpetuate such belief system. So as an answer to the question, why literary feminisms emerge? Let me give you some facts. Prior to 1970, the established canon of great works were almost exclusively male authored. That is the canon of literature, the influential and important texts and narratives uh, that were kind of famous uh, uh, in a particular place or a time. The canon of literature prior to 1970 was almost exclusively male author. Literature was considered gender neutral. Canon of literature was seen as unbiased representation of great works. So although there was less women or a few women and the literary canon was exclusively male dominated still this literature the field of literature was seen as gender neutral and was considered as an unbiased representation of great works so the feminist critics got curious why the texts prior to 1970 are exclusively male authored what is the real reason that is lying behind the fact of absence of women in literature? So when they tried to find out the answer to the question, they came up with interesting findings. So let's see, what is the real reason of the absence of women in literature? So they say that is the society in general, the patriarchal society in general, they say women didn't write. Even if they did, it simply couldn't match the quality as set by the male authors. So women actually did not write. And even if they attempted to write, they were not at par with the male authors so far as the quality of literature was concerned. But we have a problem with the term did not write. 
and so the feminists. They said it is not that women did not write. In reality, women were not allowed to write. In reality, women were actively discouraged to write and read. So they were not given the opportunity to read and write. They were not allowed to get involved in the field of literature. If you can remember Yolo wallpaper, uh, this is a text uh, written in 19th century America uh, by Perkins Gilman. There, uh, the female protagonist, the unnamed female protagonist, is constantly objected by her doctor husband because of her indulgence in imagination. The doctor said that, the doctor husband said that this indulgence of imagination, her involvement in creative writing will take a toll on her fragile health. So women were actively discouraged to have their engagement in the uh, works like creative writing or imagination that were considered as something masculine. Such attempt of the second wave feminists is not that new. Since Virginia Woolf, in her essay, A Room of One's Own, published in 1929, she addressed the social and economic restrictions that women had to face if they wanted their involvement in the field of literature. So, the second wave feminists actually continued with the analysis of Virginia Woolf and urged the readers to have a gender sensitive critical reading of the literary texts. Phallocentric literary criticism is an outcome of feminists engagement with literature. So what happens when feminists approach to literature? When the second wave feminist critiques turn to literary criticism, they found that there are less texts written by women. So, it is due to the unavailability of the texts by women, they started examining the representation of female characters in male authored works of literature. Since literature is the mirror of society, it would reveal how the male authors in their presentation of society treated the women characters. As we have already known that prior to 1970, the texts were basically written by male authors. So obviously there is an unavailability of texts written by women. So due to this unavailability, what the feminist critiques attempt to do is analyze the female characters available in the texts written by male authors. Simone de Bevour gives an early example of approaching male authored texts to analyze representation of female characters. In a famous book, The Second Sex, published in 1949, she analyzed patterns of female subordination in the work of five male authors. So in her book, The Second Sex, she analyzed the texts written by five male authors and she comes up with the discovery that there is a pattern, a common pattern in all the writings of male authors which actually works to subordinate the women in society. She argued that all literature was subject to implicit social roles and which actually uh, leads us to have these social stereotypes. Now, let me give you the definition of phallocentric literary criticism. What is phallocentric literary criticism? It is this practice of approaching male authors from a feminist perspective became known as phallocentric criticism. That is, when you approach the male authors from a feminist perspective. 
It is called phallocentric because it tried to expose the masculine bias of the literary works. That is, how and in what way a work of literature can be biased to the male characters of the text. So, approaching male authors from feministic perspective is called phallocentric literary criticism. This slide will help you to understand the idea of phallocentric criticism. Here you can see the male authored texts are being approached by the perspective of feminism. So, hope you understand what is phallocentric criticism. So, what does it mean to approach a text from a feminist perspective? Let's see what is feminist analysis to literature. So, when you approach a text from a feminist perspective, what you have to do is you have to find out the answers uh, to the questions like what is the nature of woman writer? How women writer differ from male writer? What it means to write as a woman? What it means to read as a woman, how female characters are presented by male authors. So these are the question or these are the issues that you have to address. You have to find out the answers to the questions while you approach a text from a feminist perspective. After Simone de Beauvoir, one of the notable feminist critics who addressed the idea of the construction of women within male writings is Kate Millett. Kate Millett's book, Sexual Politics, published in 1969, was very popular when it was published. She opines, it is through the combination of physical violence and cultural pressure, patriarchy oppresses women. So, this is the combination of physical violence on the one hand and cultural pressure on the other, other that these two things actually work together to oppress women in the society. A sexual politics exists in all aspects of society and culture. This sexual politics working for so long in all parts of the society and culture encouraged women to internalize their own inferiority until it became psychologically rooted. So you can see that a sexual politics that has been working in the society for so long a time, it actually made women to have faith in the fact that women are inferior to men. And this belief which is there in our society became psychologically rooted in the psyche of all in the society, especially the women politics, biological science, social system in terms of family work together to inculcate male supremacy and limit women to the private sphere only. She viewed literature as a tool of political ideology to recreate sexual inequality and strengthen the patriarchal values of society. So, literature works as a tool, as I have been saying, that literature, as per Kate Millett, is a kind of political ideology through which the sexual inequality uh, uh, is kind of established, recreated in our society, and it helps to strengthen the patriarchal values in our society and culture. So, see when Kate Millett applies her feministic ideas in the field of literature. Millett's feminist approach to Lady Chatterley's Lover, written by D.H. Lawrence. So, when she approached Lady Chatterley's Lover, written by D.H. Lawrence, a kind of a, a novel, uh, she uh, finds that in the text there's sustained celebration of masculine sexuality and misogynic presumption of female passivity. So, on the one hand, there's masculinity, the celebration of masculine sexuality, and on the one hand, there's misogyny, that is, hatred for women. 
So, uh, the HR process use of uh, language finds is a lengthy and admiring description of the female protagonist Melora's powerful body. Male protagonist glances on his lover Kuni, the female protagonist, and the female protagonist's worship of Phallus. So, the celebration of masculinity and a misogynic um, attitude uh, uh, there uh, she finds in the text written by D. H. Lawrence. Such approach to male author texts as done by Kate Millett proved to be persuasive. It permanently influenced the way male writers subsequently perceived. Phallocentric criticism works to find out the fact that how literary texts contain a pattern of imagery and a particular use of language that would demonstrate concealed attitude towards femininity. This has become a staple principle of feminist literary criticism and has altered the way canonical authors are read. When feminist critics began to approach literature from phallocentric criticism, phallocentric perspective, they pointed out the frequency with which the novels punish women associated with sexuality and lust. That means in these novels, women are punished for their indulgence in lust and transgressing the socially accepted border of morality and sexuality. Uh, the female characters uh, as they are in the texts of uh, male authors are frequently found to uh, be punished because of their engagement in lust and sexuality. Here in the two texts, Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy and Madame Bovary by uh, Gustav Flaubert, in both the texts, the heroines, Anna and Madame Bovary, are found uh, uh, to have their involvement in adultery, in sexuality and lust. And because of that, they are to face suicide out of misery and torment. So this, uh, uh, as you know, that uh, the, uh, the characters in the literature uh, uh, become role model for uh, public, for the reading mass. So this was a kind of a moral teaching that beware women, if you engaged in adultery, you are to face such uh, suicide. You are to uh, be punished uh, by suicide. You are to face misery and torment. Uh, so this is a kind of uh, assertment of the patriarchal code. Both the texts, Anna Karenina and Madame Bovary, seem progressive because of their frank portrayal of female sexuality. So prior to that, uh, there was no such frank portrayal of female sexuality. So uh, considering that, these two texts seem progressive in their attitude. But ultimately, the authors have applied conservative resolution to the plot of the novels. So this progressive attitude can be taken only as apparent, hence deceptive. Deceptive in the sense the transgressive female is penalized for their actions. Thus, ultimately, patriarchal moral code is strengthened and reasserted. So, though there's a frank portrayal of female sexuality and in this regard, the texts uh, are kind of progressive, seem to be progressive, but so far as the resolution of the plot is concerned and as the women had to face a kind of punishment, this is actually the reassortment or the strengthening of the patriarchal moral code. What is the significance of Kate Millett's project? So how do we evaluate Kate Millett as a feminist literary critic. It is her introduction of a psychoanalytic concept of literature. So uh, she introduces psychoanalytic concept in literature. According to Millett, 
it is not that men have consciously or purposefully undermined women in their literary works by limiting or stereotyping the female characters it has rather an acknowledged attitude of female writers that is responsible for such bias portrayal of women in literature so it is not that men consciously or purposefully a uh, kind of uh, portrayed women in such a stereotypical way but these are actually an outcome of the psychology of the society so for this we have to approach psychology we have to approach literature from the perspective of psychoanalytic theory sigmund freud is a famous psychoanalyst freud's theory of sexuality is based on the possession of phallus or the male genital organ a man is a man because he possesses the phallus and a woman is a woman because he is not a man thus a woman is identified as a lack not having the phallus so woman is marked by negativity since she does not have the phallus a woman is negative she is lacking the phallus biological difference as uh, it exists between man and woman is taken as to dominate woman since she lacks the phallus which confers the subjectivity so the phallus is something that gives one the subjectivity it makes one the subject the lack of female self can be traced in art and literature where women are presented as objects of men's desire and fear they never appear as complex autonomous individuals so in literature and art women have always been portrayed as the object to the subject which is man so women have always been the object of fear and desire that is there in the men so women never appear as a kind of complex autonomous individual women are not individuals they are treated in relation to the men if you remember cartesian dualism women are always associated with the passive body and men are always associated with active mind this becomes central to the feminist literary criticism so now this will help you to understand a man is a man why because he possesses the phallus the male genital organ a woman is woman because she is simply not a man so as you all know that sex is something biological and gender is something cultural and social one is female because she is born she is biologically female and one is male because she is born a male that is to do with biology that is to do with the physics but construction of masculinity or femininity or kind of the construction of man and woman is something to do with our culture and society and now from the discourse of psychoanalysis we'll see how a man is made a man is a combination of the possession of phallus positivity and subjectivity that is a man possesses a phallus having a phallus the fact that uh he has a phallus that means positivity having the fact having not lacking next a man is the subject because of his possession of phallus on the other hand woman does not possess the phallus that is why she lacks and it is the lacking factor that makes her something negative and thus she becomes the object while the man is the subject so 
so after freud i'll be speaking on the hegel's notion of self and the other german philosopher hegel argued that each conscious being enters into a struggle for recognition with the other conscious being so two conscious being actually enter into a struggle for recognition and in this struggle each conscious being concludes as he or she as something essential subject that is the self and the others as in essential object that is the other so in the struggle of recognition each considers uh, himself or herself as the quote unquote self and all the others as the quote unquote other simon de vevour uh, says that woman has always been presented as the other to man so in society in literature in culture women have always been presented as the other as something negative as something lacking as some has as object uh, which is in contrast to men who are presented as positive as subject as the self so according to simon de beauvoir in human history and western philosophy man has always been treated as the subject self and women has always been presented as the object other the psychoanalysis became increasingly important to literary feminism in a book sexual politics kate pillet critiqued d h lawrence the writer of lady chatelet lover and sigmund freud the founder of psychoanalytic theory as practitioner of culturally absorbed misogyny so kate millet actually critiqued both of them that is the lawrence and freud because of their practice of the misogyny that is there in our culture this phallocentric criticism marked the beginning of second wave feminism popular feminist writers such as Germain Greer used phallocentric criticism to point out the tradition of male chauvinism in her polemic text the female eunuch she examined literature as a product of patriarchal culture she opines a common cultural mythology can be traced in the male authors ranging from shakespeare to barbara cartland to d h lawrence what is the value of sexual politics by kate millet the true value of sexual politics lies in its proposal of a radical re-reading of texts so kate millet in her book sexual politics actually proposes a re-reading of texts in a radical way what is the radical way according to millet a text can be different as it is originally conceived to be so a text as it is originally conceived can be different from that how the role of the reader becomes very important now as it is the reader who is to read against the grain so within quotes so a reader uh, as uh, it is very important um, in respect of reading that a reader has to uh, attempt the text not with this traditional uh, way but from a radical point so as to critique the patriarchal codes that are there in the male author text so our readers role becomes very crucial in the 
feminist literary criticism because it is he or she who has to read against the grain, against the tradition. Millet wants the reader to be sensitive and critical in challenging the authority of the omnipotent father author. So the father author, the father figure or the omnipotent figure of the father author has to be challenged by the reader and for that a reader has to be sensitive. Thus, after the advent of phallocentric criticism, a text cannot be taken as innocent of sexual politics. So, a text is uh, not a kind of innocent thing. It is not innocent of sexual politics. There is sexual politics working in literature, in the literary text, and as a reader, one has to find it out. Hence, phallocentric criticism asks the readers for a gender-sensitive, critical and against-the-grain reading of literature. So, this is a slide which focuses on the role of the reader. So, what it uh, should be, what our reader should do while approaching a text uh, from a feminist perspective or from a phallocentric perspective or what a reader should do to have a gender sensitive attitude towards a text. Uh, that as a reader one has to challenge the omnipotent father author, one has to read the text against the grain to produce a different novel from the one intended. So it has to challenge, it has to kind of uh, delve deep uh, and find out what it actually wants to say and thus it will kind of uh, make our, the reader will be able to create a different novel as against it was intended to be by the male author. Phallocentric criticism as a type of literary feminism empowers readers to gain critical insight so that we can rethink the literary canon, the canon that has been uh, presented as something gender neutral. We have to rethink the literary canon, revalue women's experience, women's experience as uh, being ignored or kind of looked down upon. So that we have to uh, uh, revalue women's experience and uh, consider the, the, the content of women's writings challenge the representation of women as quote unquote other as lack as object we have to challenge such notions and recognize the use of language and imagery as asserting patriarchal values so we have to find out we have to discover in which way or how this uh, um, use of uh, language and imagery uh, makes uh, this patriarchal values work in our society through literature Thus, phallocentric literary criticism actually urges the readers to have a critical and gender sensitive reading of the texts. Thank you so much for listening.